lecture is named after Old Eltania and famous 20th century author and poet Mervyn Peake, the son of a missionary in the Far East. Mervyn Peake was born in 1911 and he attended Elton College from 1925 to 1929, where his writing talents were observed by his English teacher, Mr. Drake. He went on to become a leading writer, artist, poet and illustrator. He's best known for his works, the Gormenghast books, and he also wrote poetry and nonsense verse. His works form part of the National Portrait Gallery collections, the Imperial War Museum, and at the National Archives. He died in 1968, but in 2008, the Times named Peak among their list of the 50 greatest British writers since 1945. For those of you new to our Peak lectures, the format is that our speaker gives their talk, followed by an opportunity for some of you to ask uh, questions. This is the first time our varied lectures have had an economics theme, which perhaps seems apt in these times of economic uncertainty and challenging conditions. Tonight, our speaker is leading economist, academic and government advisor, John Birchall, who's travelled down, especially from Cambridge this evening, to be with us. John has more than 30 years' experience of working in nearly a dozen EU member states, as well as Africa, and he specialised in teaching geopolitics uh, and economics. He teaches business people, diplomats, UNICEF directors at the School of Oriental and African Studies here in London. He regularly works in Brussels in various EU institutions. He assists in developing greater global awareness among students in member countries. He's an honorary lecturer in the, honorary lecturer in the economics department at the University of Sierra Leone, and he's lectured in Zimbabwe and Zambia. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure John's talk this evening is going to leave us both stimulated and clearer about the prospects for the UK in a fast-changing international economy. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I may have set myself quite a task at the moment, trying to explain the English British economy, I do apologise, and also <laughs> where it's going. Yes, isn't it strange how a week in politics can be a long time? A week in economics most certainly can be. If I'd said to you, you may wake up in the next couple of days to find that all hell has broken loose in the Middle East, you probably would have thought, oh, one of those, yeah. Unfortunately, as you know, and I've not seen it so far today, I wonder what other horrors have undertaken those poor people uh, who live in that region. Yes. Anyway, I've got to get used to the fact that I'm reading notes here and you're seeing a version behind me. So if I turn around, it's not because I'm rude, but I'm trying to find out what's actually on the board behind me. So, here we go. Right. When I was asked to come along here this evening, I was a little concerned. I thought to myself, probably most of them aren't economists, what can I say, how can I say it, and how can I keep them interested? I'll try, let's have a go. A century ago, for those of us who are not historians, we had just lost our status as the world's largest trading nation. For the young men and women in the room, we dealt in one out of three of all exports. We controlled one out of five of all people on the eve of the First World War. That's power, that's influence, isn't it? No wonder the Victorians Edwardians, etc., thought rather highly of themselves, and as Elgar and certain others wrote for them, there are certain tunes which I don't think would necessarily be commissioned by the BBC today. Yeah, interesting age. Four years later, the mud of Flanders, God knows how many deaths of young men, sometimes not much older than the faces I'm looking at here today. Uh, we, we, we arrived at the idea that we had won. Yes. I think the Americans won because they had mass production and we didn't to the same extent. And what they could do in the 1920s, even with a decline in the world economy, was to start to make lots and lots of things at prices that people could afford. And that's modern economics. That's why you have huge supermarkets that can sell so much per square meter and can get the best price off the producers, etc. Yeah, a century ago. Now look, we'll go through where we are at the moment and I'll try and give you some ideas, but I'm not all that sure myself. So, where are we today? 
I would say that we're probably going to miss the recession. Six months ago, everybody, including the one but two chancellor, I don't know about you, but I get a bit confused recently as to who's prime minister, who's chancellor. Uh, but I think I've got it right at the moment. I was saying to my colleague, um, on the day that Mrs. Truss, chancellor, gave a statement in the House of Commons, I was driving along and I kept thinking to myself, where's he getting the money from? I was driving for about two hours when I got out to put the news on and the pound had crashed. Yeah, the city and all the, the brokers had said to themselves, uh-uh, no way, if you want that amount of money, you're going to have to pay for it. Um, we all know what happened after that, yes. So let's have a think about the British economy. We'll probably grow, but not by very much. In case I'm going to use gibberish, GDP, gross domestic product, means the actual amount of wealth that's created in a particular period of time. So we, really and truly, we're flatlining. The economy's not growing. It hasn't grown very much for a long time. So what we are seeing is the way we've got a similar sized cake with more people and therefore it depends upon your power in the labour market whether you can get a decent slice or no slice at all. I think I've got this right when I look at it again. Ah, the recent past. Yes, I say we've barely grown. I'm repeating myself because I say I don't have eyes in the back of my head and I can't always see the slides. Let's have a think. My subject is full of jargon, which to the average person sitting in this room is probably total gibberish. But we have various sectors of an economy. If we think about it, if we go back to the 18th century and the early 19th century, we live mainly on a primary sector. We extracted raw materials from the earth. We were lucky. In the Pennines, either side, we had coal, we had iron ore. If you've got coal, if you've got iron ore, you can make steel. Isn't that the first half of the 19th century? We made things and exported them to a ready-made audience of our growing colonial empire. So we had a ready-made empire that could buy the things from us. That's not bad going, is it? You can see why we got richer and richer and richer. For those of you who are unaware, other nations began to join us, and in 1883, we have a conference about Africa in Europe. Why? We divided up the spoils of the raw materials. And those raw materials, of course, kept us going right the way through to the Second World War and beyond. And eventually, even in the 1960s, when we started to give back these colonial territories, we still had special contracts to get diamonds, gold, all sorts of things. Mm. Does it never strike you as rather strange that most of the exchanges for dealing in precious metals are in London and we haven't got any precious metals? But we were the, co the commercial hub of the world. This tiny little island off the coast of Europe actually was very, very important, wasn't it? Mm. Yes. Some of the younger members of the audience might think to themselves, yes, I wonder what that must have been like. Yeah. Secondary manufacturing. If I take you back to 1960, 60% of men, men, don't figure, because most women had a full-time job unpaid. Yeah, most men, 60% worked in manufacturing. We made things. And then, of course, other countries start to grow. The Chinese and others, for example. We don't make very much, only 18%. Less than 20% of our workforce now physically, tangibly make something. The rest of us actually play a game of smoke and mirrors, don't we? We are mainly in the tertiary sector, services. So if I'm a lady's hairdresser, I get a nice line of chat by saying to her how nice she looks, where have you been, have you been on holiday, etc. I am talking to people, giving them a service, and I hope that if she likes her hair, she comes back in a month's time and sit in the same seat, and boy, I've got to try and remember what I said to her last time, this time. And if you wonder why I'm using that as an example, my dad was a lady's hairdresser, and I grew up on every Saturday morning in his shop in Richmond, where these ladies would come in and go out, and I didn't always recognise the difference, but I was supposed to open the door and say, looks very nice, Mrs. Smith, have a lovely weekend. The worst thing the poor souls could confront a strong wind down Richmond High Street. Three hours 
of hard work. And it all moved to the left or the right, depending which way the wind was blowing. I used to feel very sorry for them. Yeah. And the two modern sectors, knowledge. We have as many universities as any country that I know of, particularly when it comes to our actual size. And now they are increasingly being used, and I mean used, by overseas students. I came down in the train with t two Indian people. I never met them in my life. They said good afternoon to me, which I thought was rather nice. Um, one was a young lady, one was a young man. They come from Karela State in India. They're studying botany, Anglia Ruskin University. Then they want to get a job in Britain and finally go home. I said, why didn't you go to an Indian university, some of which are world famous? I wanted to see Britain, so I've come here. They're living in Ilford, which is quite a journey from Cambridge, three times a week. Do you know why it's three times a week? Because most universities don't work too hard on a Monday anymore, because the students have all been up at the weekend earning a job, because you don't get a grant as I did. Because mm. my dad reminded me a few times, all the people in this street, son, are paying for you. Make sure you do the work. Mm, which put it in perspective, didn't it? OK, let's move on. See where I've got to. 2022, yes. Gross domestic product. That's not bad going. We're the sixth largest economy in the world. In Europe, only the Germans are bigger. The services sector, which comprises industries, here we go again, 80% of our economic activity. European Union is the largest single trading partner, accounting for 42% of our exports. I'm not here to buy, to sell, to rubbish the European Union, although I have worked in it, and I can assure you it's exceedingly frustrating. I give one example of when I really did get frustrated. I was chairing a meeting in Paris, which had to be bilingual all day. So it got to four o'clock. Then suddenly, nobody French in here, doesn't want to get myself in trouble. The French delegation said, John. I thought, yes. Our train goes in half an hour. Do you mind if we now leave? Fluent English. I'd spent all morning trying to remember the word for whatever it is in French. And I thought to myself, yes, because don't forget, when the EU started, French was the language. When we turned up in 73, they changed it to English because more people on the planet understand English than any other language. Yes, I don't normally say that in Paris. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm back on the Eurostar a bit quick. Yeah. OK, let's move on. Right, some observations. We've left the EU. End of. Yes, or have we? If you, if you trade four out of ten goods, you don't leave it. You might not be quite so involved in it. And of course, we never joined the currency, and we didn't join the Schengen Agreement. So we were never really full-time members. They always used to say to me, you're a part-time member of our club. Yeah, but they still fed me. Usually rather well, actually, to be fair to them. We no longer have an empire. I've talked about that. We need to improve our reactions to change. Yes. Hmm. In other words, we now have got to follow a curve, if we can, as high up as possible. If we don't, there are plenty of others who will do it for us. Let's have a think. New rivals. China. Hmm. Those first five years at the end of the Second World War were, were infamous. We left India. The Chinese Revolution ended. And certain other things happened as well. Hmm. China. No longer the largest country in the world. The Indians are now overtaking them. More in a minute. Others include South Korea, Vietnam, and Indonesia. You think how quickly Vietnam has turned itself around since it was left by the Americans in 1975 in one heck of a mess. Hmm. These countries are very dynamic, their people are highly regimented, and they take orders and get on with it. And with that, they seem to get better and better and better. Air transport takes us on holidays, yes. I'm going to give a little example of how air transport also allows, and I'll use, again, the females if I may, not because I'm trying to be sexist, but I think their eye for fashion is usually a bit better than most males. As you can see, I'm not renowned for being a snappy dresser. This is me at my best. Yes, uh, okay. 
So let's have a little think to ourselves. It's Thursday, and I've been introduced recently by students to people called influencers. I don't have a clue what the hell they were. And what they do is they go on television first thing in the morning on one of these tubes things you can get onto, and um, they talk about certain dresses or whatever else it might be. Yeah. And they know how quickly people um, text each other, FaceTime, whatever else it might be, and all of a sudden the sales take off. So I can assure you, if you order a dress in Britain on a Thursday, it's probably not even made. Ping, the message is in Beijing. It's in a textiles factory, and they make it there and then. And here comes the advantage to them. They're eight to nine hours ahead of us. So as they fly in our direction, they gain. So it can leave there in the middle of the night and get to you fairly early in the morning. They go to Heathrow, collect the dress on your door, and would you believe it, ladies, if you were going to a party this coming Saturday, you'd never even seen the dress until Thursday morning. So what's happening to the high street? The ones I live in, including Cambridge, or live close to rather, all the names are going. Marks and Spencers is doing this, and this, and this, and this, and they're trying to sell more and more food. Because they don't sell clothes. I was dragged around as a child by my mother, around Marks and Spencers in Kingston, till I could name every square on the floor. Because that was where people went. And they seemed to spend an eternity in there. And we came out with a small bag, which usually wasn't for me. Yes. So, think of these sleeping giants. Brazil, the current president, has made a promise to his people that they will get into these top six nations. Yeah. Cheap labour. Think about it. I wonder what else we want made the majority of, we won't make the majority of in future. Argentina and Chile. Hmm. They're just my tips to watch. Economics is closely influenced by politics. Oh gosh, yeah. It's too early to assess the impact of the war in Ukraine. But I noticed 24 hours after the invasion of Gaza, etc., Zelensky beamed in to the United Nations and said, please, don't forget us. Because he doesn't want to get relegated down, does he? Because if he does, there will be trouble. And don't forget, America has always been a very good friend of Israel. So they will get the arms. In fact, a friend of mine was tracking flights from Californian Air Force bases within hours of the hideous events taking place. And he said, you'd be surprised, they're all flying across the Atlantic. Mm. They were flying down to the Mediterranean, weren't they? Because yeah. there are secret landing places, which we don't know about, or they land in Cyprus and wait for a day and then carry on, by which time people have forgotten. Because, of course, the pace of war means the news changes every two to three hours, isn't it? Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. The right of the Republican Party has within it those who want to leave Ukraine to itself. Oh, yes. Hence, I'm quite pleased that they decided to have a, a, um, an election for a speaker. Yeah, because it's taken their mind off what they were doing. Yes, but if you think about it, there are quite a number. And I wonder, and I do hope there's nobody here who's one of his lawyers, if a certain Mr. Trump might have wished he was in the White House at the moment. I wonder what he would have made of what's going on. Photo opportunities would certainly have gone through his mind. Because he could be pictured in all sorts of marvellous places, apparently doing great things. Yes, he's quite a character, is our Donald. Uh, I leave it up to you. And the Middle East has erupted. Now, when I wrote that, it hadn't, really. But I just had this funny feeling that it had been too safe for too long. And sure enough, Israel, Palestine, and now Iran is going around asking for support for Hamas. So that could split the Arab world. We don't know. 
All of this, of course, is taking place a long way from home. With modern communications, it's in your front room, it's on your phone every second of every day. Here we are. That's where we are. We're a rich country. Hmm. We can tell that by the quality of most of the things that we use, other than our roads. I live in the countryside at the moment, aren't I lucky, I suppose. I'll tell you one thing, I now drive like a drunk. The holes in the side of the road, you can start a swimming pool in. Uh, it's incredible. And even in the middle now, because everyone's driving in the middle, so that's going. And I'm told the worst piece of motorway is south of Bishop Stortford to London on the M11. And if you drive down it, as I do quite regularly, you'll see poor souls, hopefully never me, who've had a puncture from going down one of the holes in a motorway <laughs> where we're supposed to be allowed to go at 70 miles an hour. If you hit one of those holes at 70 miles an hour, I suspect you're going to be doing something of a circus act uh, to try and keep in a straight line. Yeah, and as you'll notice, Germany's above us. Now, here comes the predictions, and I'm being proved right. India will leapfrog over the lot. China will come in second, and the United States will fall to third. Mm. That beacon of progress since 1918, remembering they only joined the First World War in 1917, that beacon of progress will have to rethink itself when it comes to its position in the world, because economics is power. How will we need to change? We've got to enhance our productivity. Remember, the GDP is static. We don't make enough of what we're good at often enough. We're going to have to get our productivity up. Don't know how we're going to do it, but that's one of the things we're going to have to think about. In addition, upskilling. I'm looking at young men and women here who will probably never make anything with their hands. Do you still do woodwork? Or is that gone? Metalwork? They never let me in the metalwork or the technical drawing department because they knew I was a complete idiot. I made one thing in the woodwork department and Taffy Thomas, he was a lovely man, decided that my job really was to just keep sweeping up the sawdust that everybody else was making. So I'm technically absolutely illiterate. Yes. So developing higher investment in education and training. The more we put into people when they're young, the more they can help the economy as they mature. You are the future. Let's be frank. Mathematics is largely taught rote, isn't it? You do so many examples of the same blooming equation that when one comes up in the exam, there's barely any difference. I really do wonder, some of the subjects, how much real, genuine, original knowledge you possess and, and I always test this with Oxbridge groups, how can you use it? It's no good telling me it's gone up by two. What does that mean? So those of you who are thinking of an Oxbridge entry, don't breeze in and say, aren't I clever? I'm going to get an A star at mathematics. Be careful, because they may ask you what type of mathematics, what use is it, how would you use it, what happens if you find out this, etc. They know that you're going to come out with an A star. They want to know what you do with it. Because most of the seminars and tutorials are not theoretical based. They're the lectures. And one in three, you're, you and your two mates, you go week one, take the notes, he goes week two, she goes week three. Yeah, lectures are now sometimes not widely attended, shall we say. And the labour productivity. The current government's promoting maths. I've been on to that all right. My, life, my wife works at school in the Barbican, School of Music. Her Chinese students, she teaches, arrive with reasonable command of English. By, by Christmas, they speak it better than Shakespeare. Mm. And they can't understand why we don't. I've talked to so many of them. Mm. You have to learn languages. Just because we've got the most popular language, learn somebody else's. Do you find if you study a little bit of French and you go to France, the first thing they'll do once you've said something nice to them is to speak to you in English because they want to show you how good they are at speaking English. Same with the Germans, Italians and Spanish, etc. Because their languages are not international in the way ours are. Sorry, France, you're quite international, but not 
to the same extent that we are. So learn some languages. You don't have to be translating books, but if you can. Right. One thing is certain, the pace will increase. Things get faster and faster and faster. Five years becomes three years. Ten years becomes seven years. <coughs> uh, there is a potential to increase research and development for businesses. We've got to remain an innovative economy. We used to be, we still are. We've got to really focus on that. Otherwise, other countries will take it from us, patent it, and we have to pay to use it. We've lost the advantage of the late 19th, early 20th centuries. We now have to start afresh and roll our sleeves up. And of course, no one's mentioned two dreaded words, letters yet, A-I. Mm. I heard of a lovely example today in Nigeria. They can tell which family has not brought their child for a vaccination. The chief of each village has a mobile phone, so what do they tell him? Mrs. Conte, whatever her name might be, has not been there. If she comes tomorrow, her baby can be immunised against X, Y and Z. Mm. Now, that to me is phenomenal, isn't it? In a country where actually, although it's very large, with a large population, you can travel for miles and not see a living soul. But they know where everybody is because of AI. Don't know ask how they know where everybody is, but they do. Yeah. And so that little baby will be injected against it, a killer disease. And therefore might live to be a highly productive human being, mightn't they? Otherwise, there'd simply be a name in somebody's book. You came, you left. Upskilling, knowledge development, etc. We've got to get human capital up. But what about climate change? Hmm. If I'd said that 10 years ago, people would wonder what I was saying. Can you remember the summer? It's only just about finished, doesn't it? And it may even have a bit of a renaissance. And um, we're in October. If anybody is about the same age as me, by the time October came along, you were putting your Mac on to go to school. If you were still in shorts, you put the long socks up. If you're in long trousers, you breathe a sigh of relief. Yeah. I'm actually more dressed for summer than anything else. And in theory, it's not as warm as it has been. I was in Greece during the summer, 44 degrees. The roads were totally empty. Nobody went out. The restaurants, you could eat as much as you liked. They were glad to see the sun. You walk in through the door. Mm. It's attractive sometimes, isn't it? Yes. What's it going to do to rainfall patterns? These are the issues we've got to get people thinking about to make sure that our wealth creation is sufficient to allow us to live at the quality of life that we live on. The old days have gone. We've got to look to the future. To the younger members, I think this could well be your major concern. It's temperature. And what are you going to do with it? Because let's face it, if electricity prices keep going up, the air conditioner becomes rather expensive. And ladies and gentlemen, how many of us now just quietly turn down the thermostat on the central heating when nobody's looking? My wife says to me, how come 25's become 20? Uh, tilt of the earth. I think it must have been, yes, I don't know. Magnetic fields, mm, yes. And when I go out and come back again, it's gone back to 25. So the earth's tilted this way. Yeah. But then, what happens if this Middle Eastern stuff does kick off? What's going to happen to the price of oil? For those of us a little more mature in years, 1973. Yeah. That's what changed oil prices, wasn't it? We got oil dirt cheap. Because we either owned the oil fields or we owned the countries. Yeah. Nowadays, they're all independent and they've got national oil companies. So we've got to buy it at the free market price. And actually, we are very dependent on oil, aren't we? Very dependent. And yet, really, for climate change, what have we got to do with our oil consumption? Bring it down. My old boiler is 40 years old. She works on oil. 
I'm actually hoping she lives a bit longer. But on the other hand, I really should change it, shouldn't I? I should get some green friendly boiler. Yes. But it's a heck of a price, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah. What will the UK be like in 2030? Hmm. Now, for you, you chaps sitting down there, you're not, you're not that much older, are you, by 2030? You, know, you, you feel you will be, but you know, it's, you'll still probably be in your teenage years, will you? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Lucky you. Yeah. Global GDP will continue to expand, but it's going to slow. So those who are good, those who can sell the right thing at the right place, at the right time, at the right price, they will stay in business. You've got to be very, very efficient. Because don't forget, at the moment, China's wages are controlled by law, or by the party. However, have you noticed that there's a slight whiff of people getting annoyed in China by the strangest of reasons they didn't like the lockdown agreements? They thought it was power being abused, not power being used. And there is a movement, of very brave people, who are actually vocalising this. Mm. And that same movement doesn't like the idea that Taiwan may get invaded to take the world's attention off what's going on in China. Mm. Taiwan, Formosa, across that short strait. The Chinese do exercises very regularly, showing people how close they can fly to it. Yeah, and their ships go very close to it. But a lot of ordinary Chinese people don't want to impose themselves on what they see as people similar to themselves. Watch that one. It's rumbling. And they, they, I'm told that the Politburo doesn't really know what to do about it. They can't use a heavy hand. They've got a hope. It's one of those things that just disappears. I don't think it will. I think once you've got the nerve, as we all do as teenagers, to argue against somebody, you quite like it. You might dig your heels in and keep going. Then what do they do? Hmm. What have I got? The industrial structure is expected to be gradually become more services, yeah, as rising incomes in emerging markets shift spending. Hmm. Therefore, we're going to get less and less nationalistic. Because, again, think of that red dress. It doesn't exist today, but it'll be in a party in Greenwich on Saturday. Hmm. And how much has changed hands? That's fast fashion. Because it may never see the light of day again. It might have been worn once. Hmm. That's one thing we've got to look at, isn't it? It's fast fashion and waste. Numeracy, I've said that before, less nationalistic. We once ruled a fifth. Now we've got to accommodate different power blocks. We've got to get on with people who now have the power that just over a century ago we held. Current forecasts by 2030. Mm. Service sectors, 77%. Living standards will rise. High income countries could go up from 60 to 70. In other words, 10 countries today will go up to the Premier League in, ten, in less than 10 years' time. Anybody any idea who they might be? Brazil? Possibly, yeah. Anyone got any other ideas in the Middle East? The Middle East has been destabilised again, hasn't it? Mm. Vietnam, Indonesia, notice most of them are in the South Pacific, South Korea. Mm. They're the countries and they are taking the investment from us. If you wonder how I base some of this, Grand Prix racing, Formula One. I think there's almost a majority now to the east of Suez. They're the Grand Prix each year. It used to be America and Europe. Some of them have lost those. If you watch the old sands shift, you begin to get a pattern. Mm. The world's growing middle class 
will be key source of demand, but they can buy products made in different countries, similar things. They can buy products which are cheaper. We've got to become incredibly efficient. Otherwise, somebody else will make something very similar and change it and not make a mistake. I'm told, actually, that in China there are products that look very like ours and you can't tell the difference. All right, it's illegal. What can you do about it? Holidays, education, universal fashion, music. They're the industries of the future. If you've got disposable income, you don't go to Bogner. If you have an education, you expect to have the time and the money, don't forget, that you've now spent, rewarded. I don't know what's happening in this school. Quite a few schools I'm going to are telling me that professional degree courses sponsored by very big companies are now catching up very quickly with, I want to go to Durham. I'm going to East Anglia University. Because A, and I was talking to somebody recently from um, uh, Goldman Sachs, they, owe, they don't only pay um, your expenses, your grant, they also pay your fees and they give you eight weeks work during the summer. If you only stay for three or four years when you come down from wherever it might be, that's a hell of a good mark on your CV, isn't it? Goldman Sachs scholar, worked for three summers for Goldman Sachs, wherever it might be, and now, four years on, you're going to move. I guarantee, I'll be very surprised if you don't at least get an interview, then it's down to you, isn't it? Mm. So for some of you in your early teens, this is the world into which you are now having to think. I don't know what the careers departments say, but you've certainly got to look very carefully at these professional degrees. There's, there's not that many of them, and even the biggest companies don't usually get into double figures. But if you get one, whoa, that is a real feather in your nest, isn't it? Real feather in your cap, sorry. Speaking in cliches. Yeah. Back to the UK. We were the sixth. Funnily enough, we might not drop that much. We'll have to wait and see. As living standards rise overseas, particularly in the emerging markets, the UK's share is going to fall, probably by about 0.6%. So we've got to stay ahead of the learning curve. We've got to be leading things. That's why, if any of you are thinking of going to Imperial College, I'd say yes. They are right at the edge of the learning curve in an awful lot of issues which I don't even understand. And there are other universities coming up in that particular clutch. Yeah, University College London used to be mainly academic subjects. Oh, no, now they're really into the learning curve, into the horizon, into the future. And they're the skills if you learn the core at university, then you get changed by the company concern. They mould you into one of their employees. Yeah. So those of you who are passing through UCAS, etc., look very carefully at certain institutions. Another one which I favour is Warwick. Very much mathematics-based, but they now use mathematics right across a whole range of subjects. Yeah. And employers know that. They know. If you've got a 2-1 from Warwick in mathematics and physics, or whatever else it might be, maths and statistics, whoa, yeah, that's going to impress. You'll certainly get an interview. Then it's down to you, isn't it? The rest of the world grows richer, yeah. Economic weight will tend to fall, but opportunities for the UK to grow will trade. Yeah. The major empire is gone. Remember this, we are the international language. So people know our language and they trust our language and they'll trust our products and our services. But we have to therefore make certain there aren't too many defaults. You don't take it back. It doesn't work. Mm. I was amazed recently. My wife decided we were going to have some more bookshelves in, the, in one of our rooms. I can't say the name of the company, but it's, it, it appears on television. A very nice man came round, measured up, really nice bloke. He said, said OK, we have to make it by hand. Really? You make it by hand, yes. It'll be in the factory for some weeks. I'll tell you when it's going to come. When it came, it was the wrong colour. When it came, 
There were the wrong bits. When it came, it obviously had been made on a lathe, like some kid's woodwork, if you know what I mean. All they'd done was get a piece of chipboard and put two bits of plastic, whatever it was, on top, and then coloured it. Mm. If I can see through it, other people must be seeing through it. Yeah. That's not good quality, is it? If you try and sell that in Germany, I think they're going to send it back to return to sender, address unknown. Mm. If you're going to sell into Central European markets, you've got to be good, because they make it themselves. The international language, as I say, is English of business. Try me. Ring up somebody in, an, in a country miles away, Indonesia. If he or she doesn't speak English, they know the person who does. All right, they may not be speaking Shakespearean English, but they can understand what you're saying, you can understand what they're saying. The deal gets going, doesn't it? Not many other European languages are spoken anywhere near the same percentage as ours. Yeah? So I think, well, I've moved on, haven't I? We should remain one of the top 10. I'll say this quietly, the French may drop out. All right. Yes. Mm. We could, but we're going to be about number 10. Mm. So let's think to ourselves, global growth in middle class, richer populations. I'm told by people who've been in to Korea, who've been into Indonesia and such like, these people like European goods. They want to emulate what we use. So the markets are there. And as they get more and more middle class with greater disposable incomes, so they will want to buy certain types of things. Things which we can make, including our services. Yeah. Um, for example, television companies, their production units, they make for other countries. Because we do make exceedingly good television programmes. If you don't believe me, go to certain other European countries and turn it on. Game shows are quite a lot, but not say too much, because I notice occasionally if I flick the buttons in Britain, there's an awful lot of game shows, and they all seem to be basically the same to me. There's one format that seems to work. Even the BBC put them on now about, what, 6.30 or 8.30 in the evening. Depends how long Strictly Come Dancing lasts for. <laughs> I, actually, I like that. I don't know about you. Anybody? Am I alone in the room? To like? Yeah. I, I'd love to have a go. Yeah. Oh, yes. I think I might go out in the first week. Hello. But dear old Les Dennis, I think I'm slightly better than that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I do hope that Krishna stays in it for a long time. He's uh, become quite a character, isn't he, around the world. Rather than just telling us the sad news on the Channel 4 News, he now looks as though he's thoroughly enjoying himself, having, the, having a whale of a time. I just hope he lasts a bit longer. OK, so global trade, yep. Now we have got there for to make sure it doesn't slip anymore. As a result, six of the seven largest economies in the world are projected to be emerging economies. Yeah. China, India, Indonesia. Some of us might struggle to find Indonesia on a map. Uh, it's coming up like a rocket. The US could be down in third place. I've mentioned that already. GDP rankings, while the EU's 27th share of the world could fall to below 10%. And yet, what? In 1973, when we joined, we thought we'd joined the world's most exclusive, rich manufacturing club. It may shrink in size. The, Asi the Asiatic countries will get bigger. The South American countries will get bigger. And don't forget, South America is very well endowed with raw materials. So the big cost of making things is close by. Mm. And look at their populations. You can test them out, can't you? You've got lots of people with aspiring incomes. This world is changing very, very rapidly indeed. We have to look at trends and live with them. A1, I've already said, AI. Here we go. 2016, 2050. The US is going to come down. 
Look at the Japanese. I don't think the Japanese are going to sit still and allow that to happen. They're a very industrious race. Mm. And they're quite conveniently placed to feed into and out of the fast growing markets. Actually, Europe is slightly marginalised. We've got to get very good at getting things there. Mm. Vietnam, Philippines and Nigeria. Nigeria has 200 million population at least. It has large amounts of resources. It also has a very well-educated elite. I'm working with very handicapped children at the moment and they have to have somebody who looks after them. All of them are Nigerian young men and women. They are brilliant. Their patience with somebody who will never leave a, never leave a wheelchair, who can't speak English so as you and I can understand it, etc. And that's who they are, and they're, they're fantastic. I was telling my colleague before about my dear friend Ollie this morning. Yeah. And they're all Nigerian and they're so friendly. Actually, they don't work for that much either, but by their standards, there's a lot of money which they send home. Average GDP. Philippines, yeah, Nigeria. Other African countries are doing the same thing. Zambia, they're getting their act together. They are fortunate. There's no really predominant ethnic group. So the old problems we see in so many African countries of one ethnic group considering itself to be the big person in the pack, that doesn't work. Steadily lose ground. Mm. This is the world. You guys, we were joking about your age before. This is where you've got to earn your living. The sooner you get to know it, the more you can focus on acquiring the skills and the talents and enable you to stand out. For the younger members, some suggestions. Learn foreign languages. In most schools I go to, I say, how many people are learning French? Eight. What? At A-level? Eight? Yes. What did it used to be? Twenty-five. Mm. German. Italian. Spanish. Learn some languages, but don't just learn European languages, although most of them go to other continents because of the old conquistadors, etc. But learn languages. If you only learn 200 words, you can have some kind of conversation and greet somebody and make them feel welcome, rather than, hello. That's what the English do, isn't it? We shout. And, but supposedly, our English then becomes understood. It's volume, not quality. Yeah. You, how are you? Yes. Oh, and suddenly, this poor man who can't speak a word of English says, I'm very well, thank you. And what of yourself? Yeah. We have to learn the meetings and greetings and pleasantness. If you can, Learn something of their literature or their art. So you can have a conversation over lunch, which isn't simply saying, will you buy, will you buy, will you buy? Because they do get a bit bored with that, I can imagine. Yeah. We, we have the most spoken. IT. Get into that curve and be a leader. I am amazed watching people on the train coming down, what they can do by looking out of the window and still doing it with their thumbs. In fact, I actually don't use my thumbs on a phone. I use my finger. Because when I use my thumb, I usually get entirely the wrong letter. I'm just not accustomed to using my thumb. I use my fingers, because I type two fingers as well. So I think to myself, oh, it's a key. I'm going to type on this. My family go mad. They say, it looked like something's coming out of Noah's Ark. I said, well, don't make too many mistakes, but I should. So I'm now, I practice today on the train coming down, trying to send a text. I think it was an Egyptian in the end. I didn't get almost any of it right, but I'm going to get better. All right? Learn the cultures of others. Yes. You'll be surprised how many times you can go doy, 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 like that. Yes. So if you're in a country where people are Islamic, usually the lady stands slightly behind the man. Mm. You don't necessarily say much to her other than maybe good afternoon you leave your conversation to the male 
If you make a mistake there, that's a number one. Boy, 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 boy. You'll be in all sorts of trouble. Or well, you can be, depends on the country concerned. Learn the cultures. Yeah. Do you do that at school? When you're learning French, do you learn the culture? If you're learning Italian, if you're learning Spanish, do you, not, do you just learn the vocab or you try and get inside what it is to be a Spanish person? Their history, their geography, their likes, their dislikes, their culture. So you actually know Spain rather than the words they speak. And I think the language becomes more, more interesting then because you can express it in different formats and contexts. Vote. I would say we might get 70% this time because the press is working and working and working on this sea change that may or may not come. <laughs> Somebody was saying to me only the other day, Harold Wilson, may he rest in peace, in the 1963 election, was going to get a landslide. He got a majority of four. He had to go to the country in 66, where he did get a landslide. There's no thing certain in politics. I can't say any more than that. Otherwise, I'll be taking the mickey out of those who are actually governing me. Although, have I got news for you last week? It was rather good, I thought, but I better not say any more than that. Yeah. Um, Voting in the general election, local and by-elections. Get the local people who run your council to know that 75% of people voted, not 52%, which is quite often. And sometimes it's 48%, not even half the population voted for the council elections. And with that, they're safe, aren't they? Because they're not actually walking past people who said, Oi. We said we wanted more X, Y, Z. What's happening? Yes, I voted for you. Because politicians are only as good as the votes they get. If you, if you remind them of that from time to time, they behave themselves occasionally. Be prepared to change and be flexible. I've got to be, because then by time. The growing importance, sorry, I've been on too much. This is to the, not the younger people, to all of us. Ecological, environmental. I listened to this guy, I talked to Nick Robinson, I don't know about anybody here, but I, I like Nick Robinson. I think he asks direct questions politely. And he, he's like a Rottweiler, he doesn't let it out. If, if the bloke's trying to duck and weave, he keeps coming back. And I, that's what we need on the Today programme. But he's a real interesting bloke. He actually said to Nick Robinson, he was part of the establishment. You lying to the people, telling them that we're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing the other. No, Extinction Rebellion. I, I couldn't lie in front of anybody's car, but if you do, you must genuinely believe in what you're doing, mustn't you? I don't think it's a whim. You take a hell of a risk. Particularly sometimes, if you get people really annoyed, they might forget where the brake pedal is. Mm. It's interesting to listen to. I've given you the link. Um, yeah, he's the co-founder of, what is it again? Rather a dodgy looking title. Oh yeah, Extinction Rebellion. Yeah. Very interesting to listen to, the figures he's using and what he's saying. I would say he's telling us the truth. He's very, very concerned for the younger people in his audience that it's already too late to stop certain things happening. Oh. Um, I'll be playing the Three Wise Monkeys. I think I do on occasions. 25, it's cold outside. Yeah. Mm. Then I open the windows. Wait a minute. Yeah. Doesn't make any sense, does it? Yes. So far into the future. But already, we've touched 1.5. That was supposed to be coming years in advance. 1.5 to 2.5 is not that far. And that's supposed to be at the end of the century, when some of the people in this audience will still be alive and well we hope, and kicking, unless it's got too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry, I don't know. It's your generation that will have to wrestle with the challenges. It's your planet. But you will hand it on to your children. That's the responsibility for any parental age, isn't it? What am I leaving for my children to live with? Other issues, I'll have to be quiet. Devolution. Funny enough, I think that's been diffused a bit, devolution. 
Ten years ago, it was a hot topic. Not sure anymore. I have to wait and see what happens now in Scotland, now that the SNP has lost a major seat. It may be a one-off. Who knows? Mobility? Yeah. You can travel big distances in small amounts of time. IT, air transport, China, I've mentioned that one already. Laws, homogenization of laws is coming. It is of course the EU, isn't it? If you pass a law in the European Parliament, it belongs to all 27 countries. Don't worry, I'm not naive. They can have 27 different interpretations of exactly the same words. But you can't go outside the box either side. Otherwise, they, they do call you to La Hague and you have to stand in front of a tribunal and answer why it is you've not kept it. And that's pretty poor publicity, particularly if you're a politician running for re-election. Yeah? I've mentioned vote again, haven't I? Be prepared to change and be flexible. I'm going backwards. Uh, emerging markets. Wait a minute, what's going on here? Yes. Okay. The slides have got out of order a bit, I think. Um, Top one is important, business to business. You need strategies, flexible, etc. Crystal ball gazing, lifespan will increase. I've talked to some population experts who suggest to me that the next generation after these young gen gentlemen's age could live to be 120 because the killer diseases will go, providing we take notice of diet. Mm. Social security, wider, deeper, or the opposite? Starmer's playing with this one. Do you still have that bedrock at the bottom of society that the rest of us will always support you? Or is it going to open up and you can fall through? How far do they fall through? These are big economic and political decisions and they're being made as we sit in this room by somebody not that far away. Um, what will happen to the current power blocks? I think they'll go far east. In South America. India, yeah, Southern America. The moon, Mars. You're lucky. You might get there. Brian Cox has always said this, that he's convinced that we will make settlements on other planets and that we'll extract the minerals from those planets and they will save us as the, as the world becomes um, less and less able to get ourselves. None of us really know, but Certainly, un, deux, trois, quatre. You'll be around to find out, won't you? Mm. Yeah.